Hi there, Daily Gardeners. Jennifer Ebling here. I just want to give a quick shout out to the folks who have left a review for the show over on Podchaser during the month of April. I want to give a heartfelt thanks to Minnie Garrett, Valerie Tropical Gardener, Matthew Sartor, and at Bringer. Thank you so much for leaving a review for the show, especially during the month of April. You know, this month, all month long, Podchaser is willing to donate 25 cents for every time a podcast gets reviewed over on their website. And then when I reply to that review, they double that contribution. And so with your help, For each review and reply, Podchaser will donate 50 cents to World Central Kitchen, which is the organization where chefs provide meals to people fleeing Ukraine. So hats off to Podchaser for picking such a great cause. If you have a chance and can leave a review for The Daily Gardener over at podchaser.com, it's so easy to do and so much good can come from it. Today's episode is brought to you by the Daily Gardener Friday Newsletter. You can sign up for the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. Hi there, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about garden history and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and today is April 21st. Today in garden history, we celebrate the birthday of the Dutch navigator and colonial administrator of the Dutch East India Company, Jan van Riebeek, who was born on this day, April 21st in 1619. In 1660, Jan planted a hedge, now known as Von Rebeek's Hedge, to mark the border of the Dutch East India Company settlement in Cape Town, South Africa. The hedge was made up of native wild almond trees, and today, part of that hedge still lives in the Kristen Bosch National Botanic Garden and Bishop's Court. But sadly, the Von Rebeek Hedge is not considered a national monument in South Africa. And today, we also celebrate the birthday of the English landscape designer Humphrey Repton, who was born on this day, April 21st in 1752. Humphrey was trained and molded by the great garden designer Capability Brown. Yet as he matured, Humphrey began to forge his own path in his approach to design. Humphrey designed over 400 gardens. He led a transformation of English gardens that was all his own. And his picturesque landscapes are known for their gently rolling vistas, attractive clumps of trees, terraces, and homes that are nestled amongst shrubs and foliage. Like many successful modern landscape designers, Humphrey put a great deal of energy into planning his designs, and he painstakingly created these gorgeous red leather portfolios for his clients. His red books, as he called them, showcased his design ideas, and it was this way that Humphrey's clients could see his pastoral watercolors that depicted the current state of their property, and then they would lift a flap of paper and see what their property would look like after Humphrey improved it. It was kind of like a pop-up book for garden design. And that trick of showing someone the before and after of a renovation is still used today. And Humphrey's red books are regarded as impressive works of art, and many have fortunately been preserved in both public and private collections. Now, Humphrey Repton not only created these magnificent red books, but he also coined the term landscape gardener. In fact, he had that term carved into his business cards that were made out of pine bark. Ugh, wouldn't it be wonderful to have one of those? Well, in 1818, Humphrey died, and per his request, he was buried in a rose garden. Humphrey wrote these words, for his epitaph. Unmixed with others shall my dust remain, but moldering, blended, melting into earth, mine shall give form and color to the rose, and while its vivid blossoms cheer mankind, its perfumed odor will ascend to heaven. 
Well, today is also the birthday of the English novelist and poet Charlotte Bronte, who was born on this day, April 21st in 1816. Charlotte was the oldest of the three Bronte sisters, Charlotte, Emily, and Anne, and she was the only one of the Bronte girls who survived into adulthood. But their legacy is that their novels became classics of English literature. The sisters published their first collaborative work called Poems under the pseudonym of Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell. The Brontes wanted to hide their gender to help with book sales, and so they kept the first letter of their names, and Charlotte became Kerr, Emily was Ellis, and Anne was Acton. But even after all of that, only two copies of Poems were sold. Now, the author Emma Emerson wrote a piece called The Bronte Garden, and in it she revealed that the Brontes were not ardent gardeners, although Emily and Anne treasured their currant bushes as their own bit of fruit garden. And while they may not have been avid gardeners, they knew enough about growing flowers for Charlotte to write these words. Emily wishes to know if the Sicilian pea and the crimson cornflower are hardy flowers, or if they are delicate and should be sown in warm and sheltered situations. In her writing, Charlotte could be a little glum about flowers. She did not like cut flowers. And in her 1853 book called Villette, Charlotte wrote, I like to see flowers growing, but when they are gathered they cease to please. I look on them as things rootless and perishable. Their likeness to life makes me sad. I never offer flowers to those I love, and I never wish to receive them from hands dear to me. And today we celebrate the Scottish-American naturalist, conservationist, and author John Muir, who was born on this day, April 21st in 1838. John Muir was known by many names, John of the Mountains, Father of Yosemite, and Father of the National Parks. John's work to preserve Yosemite resulted in a famous picture of himself posing with President Teddy Roosevelt on overhanging rock at the top of Glacier Point in 1903. And there's a fun little story that I love to tell about John and Charles Sprague Sargent, the director of the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard. Apparently, the two men had gone on a fall trip to hike the mountains in North Carolina. Now, John found the scenery so inspiring that when they got to the top of Grandfather Mountain, he began to sing and dance and jump around while Charles just stood there. And this must have been a common trait among the botanists and academics that John knew, because he once wrote, In drying plants, botanists often dry themselves. Dry words and dry facts will not fire hearts. Well, John is remembered for his many passionate writings about plants. Here's a sampling of some of my favorite quotes from John Muir. The mountains are calling, and I must go. Everybody needs beauty as well as bread, places to play in and pray in, where nature may heal and give strength to body and soul. And finally, between every two pines is a doorway to a new world. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Royal Gardens of the World by Mark Lane. This book came out in 2020 and the subtitle is 21 Celebrated Gardens from the Alhambra to Highgrove and Beyond, and the illustrated cover is spectacular. Well, this book is a celebration of royal gardens, and Mark does a brilliant job of sharing the history, the plantings, and the evolution of each garden. And in addition to all of that, he highlights some of the key plants, some of the signature plants of these spaces and then shares all the -the behind-the-scenes details about how these gardens were designed and laid out. 
Now, the gardens that are profiled are located primarily in Europe and Asia. But as Mark points out in his introduction, many more royal gardens are waiting to be visited and researched, and each tells its own story. Mark says, I am simply the interpreter and the messenger. Sometimes the story focuses on restoration, others follow the lives of the main protagonists, and others still simply chart the course of history. It's also worth noting that history is not isolated. These gardens are a response to events occurring throughout Europe, Russia, the Far East, and elsewhere. And marriages between members of royal households in turn introduced different ideas and creative passions, which were reflected in their gardens. Now, as you can imagine, entire books have been written about each of these gardens individually. But Mark's intention here is to celebrate the art of gardening through some of the finest garden jewels that have ever been created. This book is 240 pages of a five-star book on Amazon about royal gardens, their history, their fantastic designs, and their signature plants. You can get a copy of Royal Gardens of the World by Mark Lane and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $25. Finally, we end the show today with a botanic spark that celebrates the National Day of Saadi, the master of Persian prose and poetry, who was born in 1210. Saadi lived in Shiraz, and in his lifetime and through the 19th century, Shiraz was a center for growing grapes and great wines. In fact, Shiraz wine is from Shiraz. Shiraz was also a center for learning, literature, gardens, and poetry, and the poet Hafez was also from Shiraz. Now, although he was born and raised in Shiraz, Sadi spent much of his life traveling, and over three decades, he met and interacted with people from different places with different customs, traditions, and languages, and this constant traveling led Sadi to a place of acceptance and love for all humanity. Sadi once wrote these poignant words of understanding. I bemoaned the fact I had no shoes until I saw the man who had no feet. And there's a common Persian saying that goes, each word of Sadi has 72 meanings. And today, Persian scholars believe that Sadi is Shakespeare-like in terms of his understanding of the human condition and in the various literary forms that he used to share his insights. Now, you might be surprised to learn that Ralph Waldo Emerson was a Sadi fan. And Emerson felt that Sadi's work was biblical in terms of the wisdom that he was trying to impart. In fact, Emerson wrote about Sadi in one of his verses that went like this. The forest waves, the morning breaks, the pasture sleep, ripple the lakes, leaves twinkle, Flowers like persons be, and life pulsates in rock or tree. Sadi, so far thy words shall reach, suns rise and set in Sadi's speech. In terms of a legacy, Sadi's best known works are Bustin, which translates into English as The Orchard, and Gulistan, which translates into The Rose Garden. Now, there's a very old copy of the Gulistan that features a beautiful painting of Sadi in a rose garden, and I shared it in the Facebook group for the show. So if you want to go check it out, all you have to do is head on over to Facebook and search for Daily Gardener Community, and you'll be able to see it there. Now, I wanted to end the show today with a little something from the Rose Garden or the Gulistan because in that book, Sadi is led to a garden by a friend on this day, April 21st, back in 1258. And that's why today is National Sadi Day. It's the day he was brought to a garden. 
And so there is a verse that is a favorite among gardeners from the Gulistan or the Rose Garden, and it goes like this. If thou art bereft, and two loaves alone to thee are left, sell one, and with the dole, buy hyacinths to feed thy soul. Well, that's it for today's show. Just remember that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. The next time you're over at Facebook, just search for Daily Gardener Community, where you'd search for a friend and then request to join. And if you'd like more of The Daily Gardener, you can subscribe to the newsletter over at thedailygardener.org. And don't forget that you can also show your support for the show by using the Buy Me a Coffee link over at the website or in today's show notes. This is Jennifer Ebling. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. Oh,